Welcome to the Conscience of Kansas radio show with Paul A. Ibbotson, a no-nonsense conservative talk show that looks at the local, state, and national issues that affect the people of Kansas. And now, here's Paul A. Ibbotson. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest in uh, Larry Schweikart. He is the um, he's a professor of history at the University of Dayton, specializing in business and economic history, technology and war issues, and American history. He received his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a prolific author of over 20 books, some 50 academic articles, close to 100 reviews, his online article that he wrote uh, following 9-11 titled The Weight of the World and the Responsibility of a Generation has been widely read. Today we're here to speak to him about his newest 2008 release, which is uh, 48 Liberal Lies About American History that you probably learned in school. And Larry, we'd like to welcome you to the Conscience of Kansas radio program. Well, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, it's our pleasure to have you on the program. Could you tell our Conscience of Kansas listeners a little bit more about yourself and how you uh, came to write these very interesting books. Well, um, I began as a rock and roll drummer. Uh, I toured the country for several years, uh, played drums for maybe 10 or 15 years. We used to open for uh, Steppenwolf and Savoy Brown, the James Gang. Fascinating. And and then at uh, some point I just uh, felt the call. I was going back to get a teaching certificate so I could teach high school history while I... Uh, played at night, and I just heard the call, and uh, overnight, literally in a, a summer session, I decided I wanted to be a history professor, and so I, I did. Um, I've been, for about 20 years, I'd, I'd been publishing um, academic articles and books, stuff that gets footnotes, but which nobody reads. Right. And about eight years ago, Mike Allen and I published a book called The Patriot's History of the United States, which became a bestseller and just, just did phenomenally well. And uh, from that point on, I've primarily gone into trade writing, trade publication, uh, with um, uh, America's victories in 2006 about the Iraq War, and then uh, this book, 48 Liberal Lies About American History. Well, very excellent. Of course, we've uh, heard many good things about a patriot's history of the United States. And what are some uh, in your book, this new book, 48 Lies About American History, that you probably learned in school, what are some of the... Uh, standout components that a reader might find when reading this book? Well, one of the first ones is, is not even one of the 48 lies. It's in the introduction. And I, I not, my methodology was I looked at uh, 20 U.S. history uh, college-level textbooks. A couple of these are not published by textbook publishers. They are published by trade publishers. But because a lot of professors use them, I included them books like uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at 20 books, and uh, one of the things I looked at besides uh, the content of these lies is I actually kind of looked at some of the images and pictures therein. And so it's interesting that the most common image in the 20th century section of these books is Franklin Roosevelt, and you would have no problem with that. That's to be expected. Mm-hmm. Second most common image is the atomic bomb. Okay, we, that's fine. We expect that. Third most common image in these books in the 20th century sections was the Ku Klux Klan. Hmm. Not, not Martin Luther King, not the moon landing, not Ronald Reagan, not John Kennedy, the Ku Klux Klan. And I think that tells you in, in one, one quick example where a lot of these authors are coming from. They still see America as substantially a racist, oppressive, evil country. And and so that tells you a lot. Now, um, a quick one for your listeners uh, is um, John F. Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald. If you go to the section in any of these books on Lincoln and the assassination of Lincoln, he's assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, and Booth is correctly identified in every one of the textbooks as a Confederate. That's why he shot Lincoln. He was a Confederate. They might mention that he was an actor, but it was clear the reason he shot Lincoln, he's a Confederate. Right. Lee Harvey Oswald, however, in, in over half of the textbooks I looked at, is described as a Marine 
a deranged Marine, a former Marine. Only one of the books correctly identified him as a communist. That's why he shot Kennedy, because he was a communist, not because he was a Marine. Right. But the implication there is, if you're a Marine, you must be bent toward doing those kinds of crazy things like killing presidents. Uh, finally, I would say that the what I call the pregnancy test or the litmus test of how biased a textbook is, is go to the Reagan section. And um, even books that kind of keep it together through the rest of the textbook just freak out when they get to Reagan. And almost all of the books I looked at credited Mikhail Gorbachev with ending the Cold War, not Reagan. Uh, Gorbachev just on his own decided Russia was a bad place and he needed to fix it. And he just totally reformed Russia. And then as, as kind of a side measure, he, he allowed himself to be beaten in an election. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just astounding. Reagan gets very little credit for anything to do with the Cold War. Wow. That's very interesting. I think, you know, it touches on a point that a lot of folks probably don't circle in. I think a lot of people can see when there's uh, things that just are not accurate with history, things that, you know, especially if you've lived through it, if you're old enough like myself, lived through the Reagan administration and saw what he did. Now, a lot of folks haven't. You know, younger people can be very easily duped. But what I think it's interesting also is to try to look deeper and say, who are the people that are behind the framing of these issues that are doing what you're talking about, you know, uh, misportraying history uh, to really do people to do what you call the lies. What, who are those people and uh, why are they doing this? Yeah. The, the answer a lot of people want is one I can't give. It's not a conspiracy. There aren't, 25 scholars meeting out on Jekyll Island. <laughs> That's an inside history joke about the framing of the Federal Reserve. But um, there is no secret meeting uh, of, of people, um, you know, at, at some meeting place deciding this is what we're going to write about, this is what we're going to put in. Uh, the truth is it's a lot worse that most of these books are written with this bias because that's the view these people really have about America. That's why I think it's so amazing that these books emphasize the Ku Klux Klan. For example, uh, every one of the books has a uh, almost a page dedicated to the Klan in the 1920s, and it's almost always positioned next to the Scopes trial, which I deal with in the book, and with uh, nativism. And, and it's all portrayed that uh, Christian conservatives and fundamentalists were crazy and they were cross burners and they, they opposed evolution and they just stood against everything America was for. And, and that's, that's not done by accident. That's done deliberately. Well, it seems that way. And it seems like that it's, it's pervasive uh, in media, in print, and you're talking about as, as well as in uh, academia and education. Now, you talk about in your book, one of the the big issues I think is just pounded every day, and that is the idea that the founders wanted to create a wall of separation between church and state. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. Uh, the the fundamental misperception is when we today say state, we've so lost the concept of federalism that we think government, and that's not at all what the founders wanted. The founders intended that the individual states would have authority over the extent of religion within those states. No one state uh, was to be godless. None of them wanted an atheistic state. Uh, They all anticipated that Brown would be basically dominated by Baptists, Maryland by Catholics, uh, uh, Massachusetts by the uh, Congregationalists, uh, and so on and so forth, Uh, Georgia by the Anglicans. And so... It wasn't an issue of getting God out of the state or, or God religion out of politics. It was an issue of the federal government will not tell Virginia or Massachusetts what its policy shall be. And this was affirmed by Justice Story as late as the 